Okay, so yesterday I was talking about a way of doing a very simple model of the ISM that can be put into um, a code, okay, and I was using it in the context of an SPH code. Um, however, you can uh, go and put that into other, uh, uh, other codes as well, and Simon used it originally in Zeus, as I was mentioning yesterday. It's quite a good um, model if you're looking at the intermediate scales in the ISM, you're looking at the warm neutral medium and how it converts to the cold neutral medium. And so if you want to do stuff um, like sort of um, GMC formation, large scales within the, within the galaxy, then, that, then that's probably okay. If you want to zoom right in on the GMCs and look at the temperature structures within them and the more detailed chemistry within them, you're going to need a slightly better model, okay? And so what I was going to kind of summarize today is what we do in our code for the stuff that we normally publish, okay? So this is the kind of behind the scenes of what's in the current model that Simon and I use or have been using for the last couple of years. Okay. So theoretically, we're interested in H2, right? We want to know where it forms and how it forms in, in, in galaxies because that can help constrain some of our, uh, of our theories. Now, we've heard um, yesterday that it's very difficult to see H2 and you don't tend to use it as a tracer of gas. People normally attribute this to the fact that H2 has no dipole. That's part of the issue. The more important part is the fact that H2's first transitional level, the rotational transitional level of J equals 2, is at 512 Kelvin, right? And so you can't excite it inside a cold GMC. You simply can't get enough H2 atom to be excited. So if H2 is excited and it is, and that level is, um, is radiating it, a way you will be able to see it, okay? So when any time H2 is a strong coolant, which it can be in the, in the warm ISM, um, if you have an H2 fraction which is high enough, you then can start to see it, okay? So it's not just the fact that it, has a, it doesn't have a dipole, it is really due to the fact that it has this very high energy level as the first um, excited state. So as uh, Meredith was saying yesterday, we have to resort to the next most abundant molecule, and that is CO. Okay? So what I was talking about yesterday was just how you form H2 inside a cloud. We didn't touch on the idea of forming CO at all. And so what I'm going to do today is discuss um, how that works. Now, um, CO is very useful because it has a very low, um, by a factor of 100, <laughs> smaller temperature to be excited. And so you can then excite inside a GMC, and then we can see it. And that's shown to be a fairly good tracer of cold, dense gas in, where stars, uh, in which stars form. And if you're used to looking at the schmidt kennicott relationships, all those, um, um, well, the majority of those um, relationships have been derived using the CO um, luminosity as a tracer or a proxy for the H2 um, uh, in the galaxies. Okay. So I just wanted to show this really nice um, uh, uh, montage has been compiled by the com by the complete team, and it's the Perseus cloud here. And you have some contours here from the, um, uh, which are in 13 seal, and then some millimeter um, clumps and stuff over the over the back of it as well. And I just wanted to kind of step through because, as well as providing um, an idea of the mass in a cloud, as Meredith was talking about yesterday, CO also is one of our most important tracers for trying to work out what the velocity structure is inside the cloud. In fact, so if you just step through the different channels, you'll see that um, various features come and go inside the cloud because they sit at different velocities. You have this stuff over here, which is, I don't know if you can see that very well in, in, in the room of the lights, but you know, you get this corner over here. It's sitting at a different velocity channel from the stuff over here. So you can see there's kind of a, a large scale gradient in the velocities, okay? So CO is very useful for helping us understand the structure and the evolution of the clouds, okay? Now the problem is, you know, as nice as that is, um, you get there's another movie here which swirls it around using some medical imaging software which is quite nice you get um, from the CEO data you get position position and then you get velocity along line of sight okay you get the Doppler shifted CEO and so that's all you get from your observations that's all you're really ever going to get okay and in the simulations we have position 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 and then we have three different velocities, and so we've got lots more information, okay? So when you try and compare your simulation to what you're seeing in the sky, it's very difficult, okay? You cannot put the observations into the plane of, of, of the simulation. You can only make the simulation try and look like the observations as best you can, okay? So by doing the CO chemistry inside the simulation and then using a, a tool to post-process it, you can create cubes like this. And Stellar, um, next week, I think, we'll be discussing um, a few codes such as RADMC, which has been, which you can use to um, to create cubes such as this one, uh, this one here, from a data cube which contains CO. Okay. 
So doing the CEOs is, is important. Okay, I'm sorry, there's an extra level to the simulation, but you can maybe see it nicely now. Okay, now you're all sick from that swirling around. Okay, so how do we do CEO chemistry? Well, you know, that looks a bit of a mess, doesn't it? There's lots of different reactions there. And um, yeah, you'd have to have many, many species, and we'll be talking about yesterday that you know, the, the more species you add to your um, reaction network, the slower it gets. It goes n cubed. So if you can cut that down, that's always good. Okay. So what people have done is they've come up with some various ideas of how you can approximate CO chemistry. In some regimes, that would be quite good. In other ones, it might not be so useful. But you have to think about the application which you're going to apply it to. Okay. And the, the first one I want to introduce to you is um, one that Richard Nelson and Bill Langer came up with um, in Richard Nelson's thesis in 97. And it was a fairly simple one equation for CO, right? which, is, which we, we would say is good. And it had a number of assumptions in the model. First of all, they assumed that the, all the hydrogens are already in the form of H2. You don't actually need to use that in the model. They were just looking at the CO formation. You can add this approximation to your pre-existing um, H2 formation channel, and it, it, it will work quite nicely. And what they were doing was they were focusing on the conversion of just from C plus to CO. Okay, so they were ignoring the intermediary stage of neutral carbon which we know does play, um, um, well, doesn't play a role in the thermodynamics of, of, of molecular clouds, but you can see um, neutral carbon in GMCs, and people have been looking at that as a way of maybe tracing some of the, um, uh, some of the, the warmer gas in the envelopes around dry molecular clouds. So you won't be able to get the, the neutral carbon um, fraction with this, um, uh, with this reduced network. And what, there's, what the kind of, when they're looking through, um, so, so Bill Langer really is the, is the chemist here, he was the astrophysical chemist, and he was kind of used to looking through all these complicated reactions, and he realized that probably one of the most important reactions, the, the one which is the slowest and the most important for forming H2, um, was via um, the uh, oxygen and some sort of um, CH radical um, uh, reacting together, okay? So that's where most of the CO was coming from. Now, so, so he, th so he thought then, well, if I can work out a way to figure out how slowly this reaction occurs, that would be the rate-limiting step in the, entire, in the entire simulation or in the entire uh, chemical network. Okay? And so that's what he was doing. He was working out what the reaction of this um, particular chain is, and then you use that to set the rate at which CO forms. So you assume that CO forms rapidly by this reacting with oxygen afterwards. So here we have it here, you have um, O plus um, CHX, it will probably recombine um, very rapidly, you, you, you'll get recombination, so it's not reacting with the ion, it's actually reacting with the, uh, with the radical here, and then you get CO, and then you get the hydrogen, okay? Now the problem is that not all that CHX um, is going to be around for you to form this, uh, to be able to react with the oxygen. And what can happen is that some of it can get dissociated, okay? So you have to then work out what fraction of that CH radical you formed can then go on um, to form uh, the CO. And he introduced this beta parameter here, which then just has the rate at which the oxygen reacts with this, um, uh, uh, with this molecule here. That's the, K, that's the K1. And then there's some rate at which it's destroyed. Okay. So you, you work out this fraction. And um, so once the CO has been formed, you assume that it can um, only be photodissociated, okay? It doesn't react with anything, um, and you know, there's no, there's no um, exchange reactions with any other molecules. You're just going to assume it's photodissociated. And again, that is how most of the, of the CO is destroyed in, in, in molecular clouds. So that's also a good approximation. Okay. And when the, um, when the CO has been dissociated, you then assume that it very, very rapidly gets ionized back into um, a singly ionized carbon, which is the form um, which uh, dominates in the ISM. Okay. So again, you're not following that neutral carbon species in the middle. And so what you can do now is you can just write the reaction rate for the, uh, for the number density of CO in this one line here. Okay. So you have the rate at which you're forming that radical, which is the first reaction, corrected by the rate at which that radical reacts with um, the oxygen, which is this, down, uh, this parameter down here. And again, you're destroying it. This, um, this destruction parameter then depends on the, the, the strength of the interstellar radiation field and again, where you are in the cloud, okay? It's how much extinction you have to that cell. So how much that interstellar radiation field can permeate your cloud and interact with that bit of chemistry, okay? So these two rate coefficients are, are given here. 
And if you wanted to play with this this week, I think that would be the best one to try and put into the code. Okay, so it's basically a couple of lines, and you can fit that quite nicely into the reaction network that's already there. There's not a huge amount of extra work for you to do. Okay, so if anyone's interested, please come and ask me, and we can try that. A couple of years later, they thought, oh, that wasn't very good. Let's try better, better approximation. And then they put in lots and lots more, right? So once you start, the problem is once you start adding new bits, you find, well, you know, if I put that in, I also have to add this reaction in, and then it quickly becomes a bit of a mess, and you have more things. But So this is the, the, the reaction network you that Mark Krumholtz uses in his despotic code as well. So if you've been using that to look at ISM, heating, cooling, you might be familiar with it. And it has a number of other features. It now takes care of some of the, um, the H2, so it allows the H2, not all the gases in H2 anymore. Um, it now also follows other species, so other ways of destroying the, um, the CO. It doesn't just go straight to carbon, it can now track, um, so it doesn't go straight to C+, it can now track carbon as well, okay? So you get this intermediate stage of, of, of carbon, the neutral carbon. And so it gives you a more diagnostic power if you put it into your model, okay? It also comes out with some other things such as HCO plus, so uh, to be honest, I wouldn't really trust the, um, uh, the abundances that come out from this particular model because they don't do a very good job of the ionization fraction. He, they do try and account for the ionization fraction here by having this M here. You're probably thinking there is no species and there's no thing in the periodic table that has M. You're wondering what that is. That's just metals, okay? That's anything that's kind of very high and lumpy and has lots of free electrons that can then knock them off, okay? And so that gives you a better way of estimating the overall ionization fraction that you might have in your cloud. Okay. So like I say, Simon's using that one. Uh, sorry, um, Mark's using that in his despotic code. And that's the main one that we tend to run with in, in our group because it's about three or four times slower than the previous one, but it is much more accurate, okay? And it can allow you to go from the ISM all the way down to piece of that course with fairly good accuracy. And also, it has this nice feature where you can look at the neutral carbon, okay? So then Simon came along in 2010 and thought, wow, well, could do better, right? So he came along with um, 218 reactions this time, okay? That was what, maybe 20? Simon put up by an order of magnitude. That's just uh, reactions, I can't even read it. Turn my glass on. That's reactions 88 to 141 are there, okay? So just, there's like three tables of this stuff. And then if you're interested in finding a reaction rate, by the way, for, uh, for present day chemistry, Simon's actually compiled it in his paper. And the Ks are all given here. So it's a good source of, you know, it's a good resource. So we can thank him for doing that. So anytime you want to check a reaction rate, you can go to Simon's paper and, and, and see if it's there, okay? And, um, he has lots of extra kind of features and bells and whistles. He allows um, various things to recombine on dust grains, which weren't allowed to recombine before. If you remember, we talked about um, H plus recombining on the dust grains yesterday. He's also now allowing um, um, helium and um, carbon, uh, uh, ionized carbon, to recombine on, on the dust grains. So that seems very big. And we mentioned that you know you're going is it's getting slower by t cubed. Okay. So every time you bump up that number of reactions, everything gets much, much slower. And this one is over 10 times slower than, than the very first one. Okay. So is that necessary? Do you have to do all that chemistry to get a good estimate of what the CO is doing in the cloud? So Now I should say also that this is not even the full reaction network for, for, uh, for CO. Okay, that was still a simplified reaction network. If you want to use the, the full one, that's, um, you, you would then go to some of these online databases, such as the UMIST um, Chemical Reaction Networks, and you can download the entire thing there, and then that will do it properly. And Simon did actually benchmark his against the UMIST one to see how, how well it was doing. It, it seems to do fairly well in a bunch of tests. So he would say that's probably the, you know, if you want to do it very, very accurately, that's probably the minimum you need to have, but you can do it quite accurately with, um, with Nelson Langer 99. Okay. So how good is it? Okay, so. In a paper we did in uh, 2012 there, we looked at comparing the different reaction rates, um, different models, also this one by um, Kito and Caselli, which are these uh, light blue and dark blue ones down here. Um, they're really good for high density gas. They're not maybe so good for the low density regime, and so I would maybe encourage you not to, uh, not to maybe use those for general ISM work. And um, so this was just a plot of the, the mass weighted abundance of the H2. Uh, sorry, the CO in, in, the, uh, in the simulation is a function of time. It was a turbulent cloud, one in Zeus actually, and it had um, an initial number density of 100, and then there's a more dense cloud down here. And you see the dense cloud forms its CO faster. Um, but what you see is there's a kind of rapid evolution, then things kind of start to plateau off. And um, the top bunched lines 
were the ketone caselia ones, which are good for the high densities, and also the Nelson Langer 197, uh, the very cheap one. And you see that it systematically overproduces the amount of CO that you have because you don't have that neutral carbon, right? And there's, all, there's other species like HCO plus, for example, that are included in, in the other ones, okay? So carbon can be elsewhere apart from in CO. And those simple um, uh, estimates of the CO um, formation rates don't have that in it, okay? So they always will overestimate. However, they do quite a good job of saying where you have CO and where you don't have CO, okay? So again, if you wanted to do a galactic scale um, simulation and say, where do I have GMCs? Do I have them in the interstar in, in the interarm region, or do they only form in the spirals? This would be fine. Okay, so you could use that for it. The Nelson Langer 99 does actually surprisingly well. So it actually sits down with the uh, with the big boys club down here, with the uh, with Simon's two very big uh, chemical reactions, and also with the um, so yeah, it's there with them as well. And so it does a very good job for you know at least a third of the cost, and it's much much simpler to obviously implement yourself. So if you were interested in doing a fairly robust chemical network that was still quite computationally cheap, the Nelson Langer 99 is a good option. And that's again uh, one of the reasons why Mark put it into the spot code. Okay. Okay, so that was the um, CO. We also mentioned that you have to work out the amount of shielding that you have at any point in the gas. Remember the sort of example, even that, um, even the really cheap um, chemistry, you still had to work out the total amount of shielding you have to work out how much of your CO or your intermediary species is getting destroyed, and then also how much the CO gets photosociated as well. So, you're, so, sh so shielding is key. You can have the, you know, the greatest chemical reaction network you want. If you don't feed it the right interstellar radiation field at that cell, you'll be getting garbage out. Okay? You, can't really do the, you can't really do the chemistry. The shielding, as we also mentioned, is important for the photoelectric emission. That's the dominant heat source in the GMC. Again, it's not compressional heating or shocks. It is photoelectric emission. And so it's very important that you can accurately estimate the shielding at any point. So one way which actually was presented by Nelson Langer in their paper, they were actually doing an SPH um, paper at the time, I think, yeah, it was SPH. And they, what they did was they interpreted the particles to a grid, and then they just walked along the cardinal axis of the grid to get the column densities. Okay. And, then they do a, and then they do some sort of averaging over those columns to then work out the effective column at that cell. Okay, so that was, they were using SPH, they were interpreting to a grid, and then they are working along it. Simon um, was doing the same thing in Zeus, and that's what he was using for his original calculations. If you look back at the paper with uh, Mordecai McLeod in 2007, and also the, the one where he introduces the very, very large chemical network in 2010, he was using something like this. Okay. Now, it has several advantages. It's very cheap computationally to do this. It's, it's kind of trivial. It's easy, it's easy to code. And it's also quite easy to MPI parallelize it. Okay, part of the work's maybe done for you. You can even you can also use, if you want to be uh, more fancy, use something such as hybrid characteristics to work to let each cell do its own little contribution, and then put them all back together um, afterwards. Okay, so that's that's kind of one cheap way. You probably notice some sort of problem with that. You know, it has that very rigorous geometry kind of imprinted into it. If I take this nice uh, movie by, I can't stop showing this movie. I can't. I really like it, um, by Christoph Federat. He's shown, basically, it's a, it's a turbulent cloud. He's got um, turbulence which has been driven by solenoidal driving. Um, so that's kind of when you stir the gas, more like a big spoon. And then when you're uh, uh, um, driving the turbulence by compressing the gas. So people always use the kind of monkey clapping its hands at the bottom of the symbol. That's more of a kind of, uh, the monkey clapping its hands turbulence. And then you've got the big spoon turbulence. And what you see is the gas is very highly structured. And obviously, it's not aligned with the grids, right? So you have all these filaments and kind of uh, vortices. And so if you were just firing along the cardinal axis of the grid all the time, you're not going to get necessarily the right column density at any particular point, right? And it's particularly bad if you're looking at something like a precellar core because it's round, OK? So then you get very, very strange geometrical effects occurring on the surface of your, of your core. And then you can get strange chemical effects and then also strange thermodynamical effects coming from that as well. OK, so you need something slightly better. I should say this is a. 4,000 cube uh, run as well, so it's very impressive. Um, good. Let's stop. Or did it crash my? No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we kind of realised that we needed to do something better because we were actually we were originally looking to do the chemistry in precellar cores, um, and so we wanted something which wasn't then biased by the geometry. And after some bouncing a few ideas around, what we came up with was um, trying to use the gravitational tree to estimate the columns. Okay. 
Now, gravitational trees are nice. We don't utilize them anywhere near enough. Um, they store a lot of very useful information, which we then tend to just use for the gravity and throw away. Okay? For example, they store the mass and also the angular distribution in the sky. It also knows where it is. So you know, the, you know the position vector of that particular tree node. You know how big it is because you want to check, do I have to open the node or not when you're doing the, um, the tree walk. And so it has lots of useful information. It has all the information you need to create a column density map of the sky. Okay. So everything's there. And you can imagine, so what you could do is as you walk to your computational volume, you could then say, OK, where's that tree node? How big is it in the sky? What's its column density? I know its radius. Uh, so I know the length scale of the side length of the tree node. I know the mass inside it. So I know its column density. And how does that project down onto um, my SPH particle or my cell, whatever it could be a cell, that's currently walking the tree? Okay. And then by summing up all those different tree nodes as you walk the tree, you then build up a 4 pi radian map of the cloud as, as, as you get your gravity summation. Okay? So you're piggybacking on the gravity summation at the same time to get your column density map. Okay? Um, so that's something we uh, came up with in 2012, and we call it tree call. Not very imaginative, but um, because it gets column densities while walking the tree. Any questions, anyone? Just before I continue. Yes. <coughs> mm -hmm. uh, why the uh, formation process uh, of collision, uh, direct collision, is carbon and oxygen? Okay, by carbon and oxygen straight away. So carbon oxygen is that's a, that's a radius of attachment reaction. And we mentioned earlier those are very very difficult because so carbon so it's a bit better for it's a bit better for CO than it is for H2 because CO forms a dipole molecule when it just forms. So the problem with, the, with that type of reaction is when you form that molecule for that brief time where the two um, atoms interact, you have to radiate away the excess energy from the collision. Okay. Once it's formed, that's true, right? So, so, you, so you've, got this, you've got the carbon, you've got the oxygen, they're both moving with some velocity, which is probably quite large, let's say. Okay, larger than it needs to be to form the, uh, to form the molecule, otherwise the molecule would already be formed, right? So you need to radiate away that excess energy, and it does it through a spontaneous, so you have to excite the um, electron, and then it has to then radiatively uh, decay. So you have to, so then you're tied to the Einstein A coefficient, right? You need to get rid of that energy. And typically what you find is that because those reactions, that the two molecules, the two atoms come together for such a short period of time, they form that molecule, and then has to immediately um, uh, pop off that photon, right? If the time scale for that photon is too long to come off, they won't, they, they won't survive and they'll sweep past each other, okay? So you're, you really have to wait for that very, very, you've got a very brief window where you can, um, where you can radiate away the photon. It is better for the, for the CO because it has a dipole, and so it's got a, um, a, it's got a bigger Einstein uh, coefficient. If it was H2, it's got much lower. It takes forever, like we said the other day. Okay, so that's the main reason. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Okay. So, uh, column densities. Um, so, the big question, you, well, the, one of the first questions you come with this kind of idea where you're trying to kind of you know project your tree nodes onto uh, some sort of map that surrounds you, either your particle or your cell, is how do I store the map? In our paper, we actually, on our, in our current algorithm, we use the Helpix algorithm. Um, which can be found at, the, uh, at, at this JPL NASA um, webpage. And it's very nice. It has this very nice feature that the pixels have equal angular area. Okay? They cover the same number, of four, uh, same number of ceradians. And as you increase the map, the resolution, you don't just increase it along the equator, like you, oh, sorry, along the poles, uh, um, the poles like you would with an all azimuth. You increase the resolution everywhere. Okay? So you're not biasing, like having, you know, if you have a normal all azimuth uh, grid, when you add more and more um, cells, you tend to increase the resolution at the poles. You don't tend to increase it very much outside. So you tend to waste resolution there. This one doesn't waste anything. It actually keeps the resolution everywhere. And it does it by drawing these great circles and intersect them at various points. Okay? And so you go from this, the base grid here is 12 pixels. Then you can split the side into two. And that gives you then 48 pixels. Then you can split each side again into two. Um, so it's controlled by this n side. So you have the resolution goes to 12 times n side squared. Okay. So then you go from uh, oh, let's see, 48 pixels to 19 to 198 to 769. Okay. So the problem is that, that so one bad thing is that the number of pixels jumps up very rapidly. Okay. And here's just a picture from our paper. We're taking a particle which was sitting in the in some void somewhere in a turbulent cloud and the kind of 
we had a, we made a hammer projection here of the, what the particle would see in the sky as it looked around. Okay, you see all these filaments formed by the turbulence. And you say, well, what would you see if you were to then smear that out onto 48 pixels? You don't see very much, right? But actually, the total column there is still, is still preserved. So in terms of the old angular coverage, you're still actually getting quite a good estimate of the, of the, the angular area in the sky. Sorry, the angular uh, column density distribution in the sky. And obviously, as you go to higher and higher, you can then start to pick out some of these features. But you know, um, So what we actually find is that for doing the chemistry and the cooling, the 48 pixels actually is fine. It actually gives you quite a good estimate. Okay. So we're using the heel picks. Um, okay. Now the problem is you've got a kind of quite a complicated mapping problem, right? Here, so you've got some. If we go back to this picture over here, you have some cube, which is your tree node in the sky. It'll be orientated at some random position. Um, so you're looking at this kind of funny geometrical shape in the sky, and then you're going to project it onto your grid. And then your grid has these um, diamond shapes. They go the opposite directions. They kind of go. Up, kind of spill, uh, kind of turn around 90 degrees to the to the Cartesian axis. And so you think, well, how, you know, how do I map that, that node to the mess of pixels that I have down here? Okay. So if anyone can come up with a really good way of doing that, which is very fast, please come and talk to me, and we can write a paper on it. Um, what we did is we picked actually a kind of a dumb way of doing it. We just assumed that the, the node in the sky looks like a square, always. And the pixels, regardless of the fact they're actually like diamonds, we just said, OK, they're also squares as well. Okay? And then what we're trying to do is we're trying to work out the area overlap between those two squares, as seen in this guy. But the problem, as you're probably going to realize, is if, if you're near the poles, you don't have two angular uh, orthogonal um, vectors. Okay? So you can't really work out that area in terms of an angle anymore. And so what we did was we then flipped um, every pixel into um, into a frame of reference and where the tree node that you're looking at, you're saying, I'm going to map this tree node, it sits at x equals 1, 0, 0 in, in a unit vector. Okay, so the tree node is out here. The pixel is then flipped into this um, mutation, is, is then flipped into this uh, a geometry, and you're, you're trying to work out the, the mass that's in this little bit in here. Okay? I mean, I actually find that works fairly well. Okay, so it's, 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 it, it can be quite slow. It adds maybe a kind of factor of three overhead doing the gravitational tree. Um, because you're constantly flipping these uh, pixels. Um, but we found that was the, it gave the best results, and that was the best way we could, uh, could do it at the time. Um, another way you could do um, is just to say, I have, um, let me go back to this uh, plot here, I have a, um, a vector which is spawned by uh, the center, this dot here, the center of every pixel, and then you can just ask, well, which tree nodes does it intersect and which one doesn't it intersect? The problem is for particles which sit, I mean, the tree does have a kind of Cartesian type access to it. The particles that sit close to the tree's intrinsic Cartesian axis will then miss um, tree nodes on the way out, and you'll get drops in the column density along those axes, okay? So it doesn't really work in terms of the tree, okay? You'd have to do something more clever and open up the tree nodes and then look at the particles inside them. People do do that. Um, for example, Thomas Bispas does that in his, his algorithm. It is much, much lower, okay? So we, we avoided that. So in our case, we're looking at essentially our tree nodes become like buckets in the sky. We're saying, I want all the mass that sits inside that solid angle, okay, regardless of where it is. And so we don't miss any of the tree nodes. Um, so the accuracy in the original, in the, in the implementation that's actually written in the paper, the accuracy was better than 10%. That doesn't sound very good. Um, but in fact, a column density um, estimate of around about 10% is actually pretty good um, for, for, for most applications and, and will do a fairly good job. It does a fine job for dust heating. It does a fine job for photoelectric emission because they have exponential uh, functions of the AV. Um, what Richard Wunsch, so I should say that this algorithm has been ported to Flash now, because Flash now has a gravitational tree, and Roby will be, Roby Banerjee will be talking about that next week, I think on Thursday. Um, Richard Wunsch ported this tree call algorithm for doing chemistry in Flash. There's a big um, project led by Steffi Valch called um, the Silk Project, uh, and it's looking to try and um, capture the life cycle of an entire GMC and looking at supernova Ganoff and looking at all the chemistry and where the GMCs form. And so they needed something to do the shielding. And so Ricard thought it'd be useful to just port you call over. So it is now in Flash if you want it. I think it's also on the publicly available version. So if you want to download it, I think you can. If not, then email Ricard if you're using Flash and he can give it to you. But he pointed out that 
the way we were doing the, um, the summing wasn't really guaranteed to conserve mass. Okay? So we were assuming that all those little contributions to all the pictures that we had would then add up to the total amount of mass that we had in that tree node. That wasn't numerically um, de uh, determined by our, by our sum. So then we do an extra step afterwards to be normalized, and then we find the errors get down to around about a few percent, okay? which is actually much better. So. Um, the accuracy is obviously going to depend on the, on, the, on, the, on the type of the tree walk. If you did a very, very crude tree walk, you will get kind of lower errors. Um, obviously, it will be faster using uh, more uh, less nodes. And also, obviously, it depends somewhat on the resolution of the, um, of the pixelation map in which you're trying to store the stuff. Um, if, you, if you can't see small scale features and they end up important, if your clumping is important in, in the medium, for example, and you can't pick it up with the 48 pixels, then you would need something better. So for certain features, for example, for doing photoionization, it might not be as useful. Um, we need to check and see how that works. Um, it has a number of nice advantages. Uh, the first one is that it is naturally adaptive. The tree already is a hierarchically adaptive thing. Okay? So the things which are closest to you get added. Um, at higher resolution, and then as you go further and further away, um, things are added much more crudely. And so it means you don't really need to worry, uh, to worry about, you know, worrying about the various distances things are from each other. It will naturally take into consideration the adaptive nature of the hierarchical nature of the cloud as you walk around it. It's easy to paralyze because it's been done for you. It's also very important. <laughs> okay. Whoever wrote that tree already paralyzed it, potentially. So a lot of the hard work's been done, and all the work that you're doing here is mainly local. Okay, so you're just doing a local uh, sum, which you could then potentially put in a GPU if you wanted or something as well. Um, in terms of implementation, it's also quite easy. Um, you just need to find that point in the tree where you're doing your gravitational sum. We're actually adding up this, um, the gravity calculation, and then you need to just insert this line which calls the algorithm and does the mapping for you. Um, another thing for, at least in SPH codes, and they're trying to play with this in Flash as well, it doesn't need to be done every time set, but I did say that it does slow down the tree walk by factors of two to three, depending on how many um, pixels you have. You don't need to do it every time set because most of the time the column density maps in the sky aren't changing that much. Okay? And if you're just looking at the chemistry and the photoelectric emission, you're not making a huge error there by, um, by doing it less often. I normally do it every five times in Gadget, and I get almost no difference in the, in the outcome. And that means that essentially it becomes computationally free. The gravity then becomes the most important part. Um, you can also, I should say, you can also depend, you can use it to calculate anything that's in the tree. So if you had, um, in our case, we actually don't want to just know the column density, as I was saying the other day, we want to know the H2 column density, because H2 self shields the molecule. And so you can then store the H2 abundances in the tree nodes, and then you can create a, abundant, a massive H2 at each tree node as well. And so when you're adding up the columns, you can then add up a column density of H2 and store that as a separate map. Again, we do that for H, we do that for H2 and also for CO. Seal doesn't um, self shield as well as I said. You know, I was talking about that yesterday, but it does self shield a bit, so it's useful to have it there. Um, but you could do anything. You also put velocity information. I'll talk more about the putting velocity information into this uh, tomorrow to do better line cooling and also getting um, yeah better sub level lengths. And um, you can also use it to store optical depths if you wished as well. Okay, so it's already been implemented in a few codes. If anyone is interested in getting the basic algorithm and putting it into a tree code, come and talk to me, and I can give you the subroutines. Okay. Disadvantages, it can be very memory hungry. <laughs> so in Gadget, it has a strange way of walking the tree in that it doesn't send all the information that it needs from the other tree nodes to the node which is currently walking the, um, the tree. It, it sends a copy of that particle to all the other tree nodes. Okay? So the problem is you have to drag a map with you as you go and do that walk. And then you, ask, you also have to keep an extra map on the, on the home processor to store the other contribution from the local part. So then you have two times n picks for each particle, and then maybe times three if you're then having column density of total column density, H2 column density, and CO column. Okay, okay. so we actually have this massive uh, memory overhead in our simulations when we're doing this. Okay, if you were to use a code such as gasoline, which has the tree written in a different way, you don't have that problem. You can then just store one map for every particle that's currently walking the tree on that thread on that CP uh, on that CPU. Okay, so if you're using OpenMP, then you might have a few. Um, locally within that thread, okay, but so the memory overhead is much, much uh, more reduced, and then you can get away with storing larger maps if you wish. Okay, and again, in Flash, you don't have to, you don't have to do this communication. Um, you don't have to do the the tree sends information to the node in, in, in question, so they don't have a, a very high uh, memory overhead there at all, which is good because Flash has a bit quite a high memory overhead in general, so they're trying to keep that small. 
OK, so that's a few disadvantages. Um, so how do you use the rays once you've got them? You know, mentioned before you have this AV. You're trying to work out the total amount of um, extinction. What do you do with it when you have many? Well, you simply just um, you do an exponentially weighted average like this to work out some mean effective AV. Okay, so you go around to pixels, you work them out, you work out this function here because almost everything that you do will rely on some kind of exponential fall off. Okay, so if you do that first when you finish, and then you just store this one value after then you can keep that value and then pass that to your chemistry later, okay, and then you can pass that to your photoelectric emission heating. Okay, so that's how we do it in the code. Any questions for anyone? How are we doing for time? Okay. So, um, yesterday we talked also about um, the dust and the fact that you have transfer of energy between the gas and the dust, okay? So that's one of the sources of cooling you have, especially at high densities. Um, in the model that I was presenting yesterday, we were just kind of assuming uh, that the dust temperature is fixed and that it can deal with whatever energy that you give it and that somehow it's been kept constant by some interstellar radiation fuel bath. Um, that's what's currently in CERN if you want to use uh, the chemistry uh, module. However, in, you know, if you want to actually look at pre-stellar cores, um, we know that pieces of course have this temperature profile. They tend to be warmer on the outside than they are in the centre. And the reason why is that the UV photons that are heating the dust get just get absorbed on the outside, and they don't make it into the centre. Okay, so you're not heating the core at, at, at the centre region. So, so you get this temperature drop as you move to the centre of the core. And ideally, you'd like to be able to kind of capture that effect. And so we um, try to self-consistently solve the solve the dust temperature in our models. Um, and we do it in the following way, we kind of balance the heating and cooling processes and we iterate around until we get a self-consistent temperature. Okay? So we're assuming in this um, that all these things are changing faster than the time step in which I'm evolving the code. Okay? And that tends to be true for the regime we're looking at. If we were to go much deeper into the cloud and the be thick regime, this assumption would then start to break down. But for our, um, you know, just trying to form a piece of the core, this actually works fairly well. Okay, so they have these various different terms here. What are they? The first one you have, um, and potentially the strongest one, is the heating due to the absorption of the interstellar radiation field. Okay, that's the one you're trying to work out from your column density attenuation. So that's the UV photons coming from the interstellar radiation field, coming into the cloud, and then they heat your dust. Okay. The next one you have is the heating from H2 formation on the surface of the dust grains. And as I was saying the other day, you know, this thing is hugely uncertain. Okay, so people don't really know exactly how much heat should go into the dust grain. So um, again, people quote various different numbers, and you can pick one and then run with that. You probably should change it every so often just to see the difference to, uh, for yourself of what would happen if that was changed within the uncertainties. Okay, and we actually find it's not as big as this one here, so you, you don't tend to make too much of an error. Um, the other one you have is the heating from collisions between the molecules and the atoms and the dust grain. Now, that's the one that's cooling the, uh, that potentially is cooling the gas. Okay. Now I should also say that it doesn't. It goes both ways. I've written as a heating term here because I have to pick a symbol, so I picked the gamma, because we normally think of it as a coolant. If the dust, if the gas temperature is lower than the dust temperature, it will rise up to the dust temperature. Okay. So the gas will be heated by the dust grain. Okay. So the dust, in that sense, acts a bit like a thermal reservoir, and drags the, uh, the gas up to it. Does that occur um, in reality? Well, not sure. We do see it in our models. We're not sure if it you know, really happens in reality. Um, we find that if you have CO cooling, it uh, can actually get you down to maybe 5 Kelvin at number densities around about a few thousand to a few hundred, uh, so to, to a few tenths to four. And also, um, in a turbulent cloud, you can have failed compression. So you have this, uh, you have this uh, kind of turbulent flow that tries to create a, a piece of the core. It fails and it re-expands again. And then it adiabatically cools, and it also cools because it has CO. Okay, so then it drops to a very low temperature, and then if it finds itself um, suddenly pushed back into a high density region again, gently pushed into high density region, it can then find itself um, being dragged up the dust temperature. Okay, so we do see that in the models again. Um, I think there is some evidence of cold, uh, of very cold CO as well uh, in molecular clouds, but I would need to check. But and the final one, obviously, the one that's balancing all these heating terms is the dust cooling. And that's just the dust radiating away the energy that it has. Okay. And then we iterate all this round and set it to zero. So how do we solve all these terms? Oh, yes, also the implicit assumption that the time scale of these changes is shorter than the time scale in your simulation, your DT for your time step. 
how did we do it? So we actually follow the um, prescription outlined in Goldsmith 2001, um, where the he um, first of all just takes the heating term and he kind of puts it into um, an optically thin term, and then there's attenuation factor chi, okay, which is um, goes in front of the t optically thin term. The optically thin term is just the heating rate you would have if there was no attenuation at all, okay. So it's just integral over your radiation field. You've got your dust opacities come into this law here. And you're integrating it over here, and this is the amount of energy that you absorb that is then given by the, the, the um, total uh, density of the dust. So rho here is the gas density, and d is the dust to gas ratio. Okay. And then what you can do is you can pre-compute. If this radiation field doesn't change, you can then pre-compute this function chi as a function of um, column density, which is just um, the, the full um, attenuation equation. So this is now the the, uh, the photons coming in. They're attenuated by some optical depth, and then you're weighting it again with this optically thin um, integral in the bottom. Okay. So then when you multiply, so if you work out in your code, you work out what your um, your column density is, and that gives you back a chi. Okay. And you can put it in here, and you can do that for every pixel along every pixel in your Helpix um, uh, scheme, or if you're using six ray, you would do it in the six ray one. And that angular, but by doing that, average over all these uh, pixels is equivalent to doing the integration over solid angles, okay? Because you have equal area pixels. If that wasn't the case, then you'd have to do, you'd have to take care of the, of, the, um, of the solid angles here as well, okay? So that's currently how we're doing it in the code at the moment. Any questions? How's the dust cool? Well, in the case where the dust is optically, th so in the case where, the, where everything's optically thin, the dust cooling is, is trivial. It's just then given by the, um, the black body curve for a given temperature of the dust times the cap of the dust and integrates the overall frequency. And again, you have to put it into terms of how much it's giving per cubic centimeter to a volumetric cooling rate. So you have the density out here. Again, you have the, the gas dust ratio. Okay. Now, in our model, we tend to kind of, for the opacities, we tend to adopt a mixture. We use this Ossinkoff and Henning opacities at, um, at, at uh, wavelengths of longer than one micron. And at shorter wavelengths, we use the Mattis et al. ones, so we kind of splice them together. And we find that, you know, we don't actually have to solve this in, 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 the, uh, in the code. We, you can find that if you actually just um, plot this and work it out as a function of, you know, for, for different temperatures, you actually get quite a nice um, law where the cooling goes as some uh, prefactor and t to the six. Okay, so dust cooling, is, you know, goes to t to the six normally. It's, it cools extremely well. Okay. And this um, particular, so th this cooling law here is accurate in a few percent within the range of dust temperatures that we're going to be looking at in most of our models. Okay. So that makes the cooling very, very quick. Okay. So then you're just adding those terms into that equation, and then you iterate until you get a constant dust temperature. Okay. Any questions there? Okay. So um, just to kind of come back to this um, heating on the dust grains, just for, uh, for those of you who maybe uh, fell asleep there already, um, the excess energy from the H2 formation is split into these three different components. And like I say, each of them is fairly uncertain. Some of it goes into the kinetic energy of the H2 molecule itself. And so that then heats the gas. Some of it will go into the, the internal energy uh, levels within the H2 molecule, and they can then be collisionally de-excited elsewhere in, in the cloud, and then can heat the gas, or it can then radiate away, depending on, on whether it gets collisionally de-excited or spontaneously de-excites. Uh, uh, de and then some of that energy goes in the dust grain. Remember, I said that that energy that goes in the dust grain is very uncertain. Um, so unless the background radiation field is very, very small, um, you'll tend to find that the interstellar radiation field heating term will be the dominant uh, factor there. And at the densities where you are interested really in having the dust temperature, you tend to find that the gas to dust uh, coupling term will also then be the strongest term. Okay, so you don't really have to worry about this one too much. Okay, so how good an estimate is this? Well, we did a kind of, a, using Chico, we did um, a comparison between RAD-MC and um, Chico in our code, and the orange plots here, so these were two different clouds. One was a one solar mass cloud, 10 solar mass cloud. They were just uniform density spheres bathed in the standard, uh, well, a standard radiation field. We picked the one from black. Actually, black and drain, I think it is, a combination of the two. Um, we use a standard uh, radiation field that's scaled to um, the local um, drain uh, field. And we found that the temperature profiles in the cloud were given by these blue lines from the tree call. 
and the orange scatter here is what you get from the Monte Carlo. Okay, so you might think, well, tree code's done a better job than the Monte Carlo. No, <laughs> the Monte Carlo code, if you add more photons, will eventually converge to the right solution, whereas Chico will probably always converge to the wrong one because it's, it's simplifying the physics. In many ways, it's only doing the attenuation. It's not doing the re-emission from the dust grains and how those are reabsorbed inside. Okay, So you are making an error there, and it's a systematic error in, in how you're treating the physics. Um, but what was nice from our point of view was that you know we're getting within roughly within, the, within, the, within one Kelvin or so, we're getting roughly the right shape. Okay, it's maybe a little bit steeper in, 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 in certain machines. So if we're looking for in terms of the hydrodynamics, that's probably fine. Okay, if the dust temperatures are probably fine. If I wanted then to compute an SED of that core, and then compare to the observations, I would then have to then uh, put the put the gas into the or put the cube into the, in, in, into rad MC. Obviously, do the radiation transfer properly. Again, Stellar will be talking more about that uh, uh, next week. Okay. Okay. So. One of the other big things you have in the code is um, obviously is line cooling. You know, we mentioned that uh, C plus is one of the dominant coolants. And um, then when you get to higher densities, then CO starts to form, and then it takes over as the coolant as well. <coughs> okay. And the problem is that both those processes can become optically thick. So in the interstellar medium, C plus doesn't really become optically thick normally because it normally converts itself to CO first. Okay. So then you really have to worry about then the CO becoming optically thick and treating it the, the amount of cooling that you get from that species correctly. And the kind of standard way of doing this in literature is to do some sort of um, escape probability um, and assume a sublet length. So you do that in the following way. Your heating rate, sorry, cooling rate, is given by the normal amount that you'd have from that particular um, transition uh, where this um, N here is the, so, so X is the whatever species, in this case it would be CO, and N L to Z, uh, LU is the number density of the upper state, and you have the Einstein coefficient for it, and then you get the photon coming out. Okay? So that would give you your optically thin cooling rate. What you want to do in the escape probability is say, well, what's the chance of that photon escaping my parcel of gas and actually, actually getting out? Um, and that comes in here, so it's, a prob it's basically a probability, and it's given by this formula here. We have uh, the exponential um, term on the top with the, with the uh, the optical depth, and you have the optical depth in the bottom as well. And you compute the optical depth is basically then just given by your ca your um, opacity for that line, and also some length scale. Okay. So the question, so the, the bit you come back again, how do I calculate that length scale? Okay. That's the tricky part. And because we're doing GMCs and GMCs are turbulent, um, you have large velocity gradients within the cloud, and so. You're probably aware that if you have a large velocity gradient, then a lot of the gas can then Doppler shift itself out of the line. Okay, you don't see it anymore, so it won't actually be an effective. It won't contribute to effective column density. Okay, so that can reduce this, the length over which you have uh, your species causing the opacity. Okay, and the name for that is the Sobolev length, and it's given by the, the thermal velocity over by the actual velocity gradient that you have. Okay, and what in practice what we do is we take the uh, um, if this goes to, obviously, if the velocity gradient goes to zero, this becomes very, very large, obviously. So in practice, what we do is we take the minimum of that and the local gene's length just to stop the uh, thing from blowing up in general. Okay? So this is a good approximation when you have um, very strong uh, velocity gradients. As you get into your piece of the core, however, the velocity gradients die down, and then you, you approach just having um, thermal velocities in terms of turbulence. And so these two become equal, and then it's, this becomes a very, very bad approximation. Okay. It does, so we're probably um, then uh, become small. We're probably over uh, underestimating the amount of cooling that we should have in the simulation. Okay. So you're not quite sure of what you, you, you hit a regime where you're actually not quite sure of what you're doing anymore when it comes to um, sonic uh, scales. Um, the other problem is, again, that you're also assuming that over this length scale, that all the gas is in this state. Okay, you're not entirely sure of how to do that. Okay, so you're making an also approximation. You're extrapolating a local quantity over an arbitrary length scale. Okay, so you are going to make an error there as well. Now, although that seems it has these two huge errors, that is actually the um, state of the art in the field, and um, it's very difficult to do line cooling any other way. And this is used extensively in primordial star formation. I'll talk more about that tomorrow. Um, so any ways you can improve in this are, are very good. And we'll show you um, some work done by a student in Heidelberg is trying to make this better uh, using tree call, actually. Okay. So you can then, because you have, um, <coughs> you can then express your, um, your opacity in this following form, and then you can just parameterize everything in terms of temperature and the column density of the species. It means you don't have to then do lots of work 
while you're doing the simulation, you're not going to calculate that um, alpha all the time. You're just going to parameterize it in terms of these two uh, things and have a lookup table. Okay, so you're not doing any extra work in the simulation. You don't have to do. Ten minutes. Okay. So just for the last few minutes, I'll probably not have to use a full ten minutes. Just want to show some science examples of things you can do with this. Uh, do a bit of astrophysics. Um, once you have one of these kind of uh, Kind of models in your code that can handle various different processes, you can then say, well, pardon me, what happens when you twiddle some of the parameters in there? For example, here we were twiddling, I showed this plot already in day one or so. Yeah, so here you were just uh, we're twiddling the, um, uh, the metallicity of the cloud and looking to see what was happening to the seal. Okay, so again, we're dropping the metallicity, you have different amounts of photoelectric emission in there, there's different amounts of shielding in the cloud because you've also dropped your dust and it affects the chemistry in different ways. Also, you then have less species because you then reduce the amount of metals in the clouds. Okay? So we find that for, for this particular case, we found that the star formation rate in this cloud wasn't particularly changed. Okay? But you did have this drastic effect on what would happen if you looked at it in CO. So here were some maps made by the CO 1 to 0 line that was um, taken out from, this, uh, from these clouds. You can't really see it very well here. Um, but you also find that as you go to lower and lower metallicities, the gas becomes hotter and hotter and actually washes out a lot of the structures. Okay? So what we find is that you, find you, you form these bigger clusters as you go to lower and lower metallicities. Um, to some way might be good because globular clusters are low metallicity and there might just be a scaled up version of that that's happening for them. Um, but yeah, so you are making a, so you are changing this type of the star formation that you have in the clouds, it's changing to a slightly different mode. Okay? Another way of visualizing this um, was actually just to look at the temperature density diagram. So uh, a good way of visualizing what's happening in thermodynamics in, in, in your cloud. Here's a standard case up here, the solar cloud, which was very similar to the stuff I was showing you uh, on Monday. You had the C plus balancing the photoelectric emission cooling down here. Then eventually, OK, here things probably got a big rise here from, from the H2 formation heating. And then you coupled to the dust over here. And then we colored it with the CO abundance. So you can see where the CO is actually forming in the temperature density phase diagram. Okay. And then, so these were, um, these were initial conditions that started with all the H2, well, with, with no H2, they started fully atomic. And then the right-hand panel, we started with all the H in, in H2, okay? And you find we get some slight differences. You have this, um, you get rid of that H2 formation heating bump, obviously, because your H2 is already formed at the beginning of the simulation. Um, and you get more coal gas forming down here because you form more CO more rapidly, and the CO can cool you down a little bit further. And you can see as you drop then the metallicity in the gas, the CO starts to form at higher and higher densities. And so it becomes more like a tracer, like sort of N2H plus is a tracer of dense cores in present day star formation. CO will become more like N2H plus in, 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 in low metallicity environments. It, becomes, it really does then start to trace the actual star forming clump and not the fluffy environment of the cloud around it. Okay? And you also see here the, the cloud is getting gradually hotter and hotter and hotter. And this dust gas coupling uh, regime is occurring at a higher density and it's also getting hotter as well. Okay? Just so, you, just so you know, the reason why this is yellow down here and red at the top is not because the CO hasn't formed yet. It's going to get red later on. There's less carbon, less oxygen. It can never get to red. Okay? It's just the metallicity is lower, just to point that out. Okay, so that's one of the things you can do. You can just change some of the parameters you model, and then you can run it, and you can see what happens in different environments. Another one we looked at was looking at the galactic center. The galactic center is a very harsh environment. You um, have highly elevated uh, radiation fields there. We also believe that the cosmic ray ionization rate is highly elevated from the big bursts of star formation that have occurred there over the last, um, the last 40 uh, mega years or so. And um, we wanted to know, well, what effect would that have on the gas and dust temperatures? And again, those are free parameters in a model. We can then just twiddle them and then see what comes out there aside. And we picked a simulation here, which was very similar to a, a cloud called the Brick. It's called the Brick because it's very, very dense. It's also been called the Lima Bean in, in the literature as well because it looks a little bit like a Lima Bean. Um, but so it has a mass of 10 to the 5 solar masses sitting at a number density we think of 10 to the 4, right? So it's incredibly dense. Um, and it could be one of the precursors to these um, really supermassive clusters like the, um, Ar the Archers or Theric Doradus. Um, and so what we wanted to do is we wanted to try and understand what causes the gas and dust temperatures that are observed. And what people tend to see is that the gas tends to be very, very hot. It tends to be about 60 Kelvin or maybe higher. Again, those are quite uncertain measurements from the observations, but still that seems to be roughly in the ballpark. And the dust um, emission um, was 
that came from the Herschel observations would tend to suggest the dust temperatures are around about 20 Kelvin or so, right? So there's a difference between the, uh, the dust and the gas. Now, number density of 10 to the 4, you'd expect the two of them to be coming the same, okay? If there's nothing else there. You'd expect the dust to be able to cool the gas down to its own temperature and then be able to radiate that energy away. So something is strange there, and uh, we wanted to figure out what it was. What we figured out eventually was that to recover the observed gas temperatures of the hot ones, we needed this very high cosmic ionization rate. What it was doing is it's continuously pushing the gas away from the dust. Right? So the, ga the gas can never settle down to the dust temperature. It always gets ramped back up again. And we found um, to, to recover the, um, the gas and dust temperature, we needed um, to elevate what we think the ionization rate is and the instead of radiation field are in the solar neighborhood, we had to elevate that by a factor of a thousand, basically. Okay, so that kind of fits with some of the uh, other observations what people have been seeing in the galactic center. Okay, and here's just a phase diagram. You can see eventually the gas and dust do couple, but it, it's just the dust temperature down here and the gas is here in the density space. Eventually they do couple, but not until you get to like a density of 10 to the 7 or so. Okay, so that's 1,000 times higher than it does, well, maybe 100 times higher than it does in a local GMC. Okay, so that's something else you can do, you just twiddle the parameters. The other thing which you could do, because you have all, this, you know, you have all these different, um, different chemical species in there, and you have these different heating and cooling rates, you can ask, well, which heating and cooling rates dominate? I've got another confusing diagram up here, um, but the only one I want you to really pay attention to is the fact that, so this was a hot cloud, this is when we were blasting it with the UV and the cosmic rays. This blue line here is oxygen cooling, okay? and we found that oxygen cooling was balancing the cosmic reionization rate. So these clouds don't cool by CO or C plus in the galactic center. We would then predict from this model that they would have to cool by neutral oxygen instead. Okay? So that's again, that's an observational test. We can then go away and see if that makes sense. And you can look at this, um, the auction with things like Sophia. Okay. So um, I think that's probably my last slide. Yes, I'll stop there and take any more questions. Thanks.